Our next guest and topic, it's a little geeky, but you're smart, I know you can handle it. We're gonna be talking about something called quantum computing. You've probably heard the term before, and now you're gonna know what it really means. Quantum computing is what lets us have major advancements in medicine, breakthroughs in science and financial analysis. These are the most powerful computers on Earth. Last year, Google announced its quantum processor made a calculation in 200 seconds. That would take the world's fastest traditional supercomputer 10,000 years to make. Joining us now is Dr. Eric Lucero, staff research scientist on the quantum AI team at Google. So first, let's break it down, doctor. How would you define quantum computing to say your mother or, <laughs> or your aunt or your grandmother? How would you define that? Sure, sure. Well, first, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, a quantum computer is a computer that speaks the language of nature, and that's quantum mechanics. What we go out to look at how to build a system like this, we look at what are the constituents in matter that assemble, say, quantum behaviors in, in nature, and we want to bring those things together so that we can actually control them in a way to make a computer that will do computation for us. How does it do all these calculations at 10,000 a second? I mean, what happens behind the scenes? That's a great question. So a lot of it is that you're using something called superposition. And superposition is this really nice feature in quantum mechanics that allows us to actually amplify or de-amplify the, the actual correct answer. So when we set up an experiment, we actually allow the system to evolve and it's almost like a wave interference. You drop a rock in a lake and you see some waves. The things that are amplifying are going to be the correct signal, and those that are actually de-amplifying will be those that are not the correct signal. Okay, so when you're talking about a quantum computer, is it a massive computer? <laughs> yeah, so it's actually, it's a physical object. It's, a, it's about the size of a, you know, it's a big cylinder. So if you had maybe two people around it, you could hug it. Um, and it's a full system, but the chip itself could sit in the palm of your hand. So the quantum processor that we've built, uh, so so-called Sycamore processor, sits in the it sits in the palm of your hand. But there's a number of things that have to actually connect to that system: wires, and then they come all up to the very top of the cryostat, which is the refrigerator that we use. These processors have to be kept very cold. So we want to basically keep a, a very zen-like state for this space. So it's very dark and very cold. In fact, it's some of the coldest places in the universe. So ambient temperature uh, here that we're sitting at, enjoying it in, in my uh, studio and your studio, is uh, 300 Kelvin. It's about room temperature. The temperature at which, say, nitrogen becomes a liquid is 77 Kelvin. The temperature at which water freezes is 273. So these are very good, very cold. If we were hanging out between galaxies in space, it's about 4 Kelvin. And we actually go orders of magnitude colder. So we go down to 10 millikelvin. And that's actually where our processor sits, at 10 millikelvin, in a very dark place inside of this refrigerator. Okay, so why does it have to be so cold? That's a great question. We use a superconductor. Now, that is actually just aluminum. Aluminum turns out if you cool, if you cool it down past what's called its critical temperature, it becomes a superconducting metal. And that means that electrons no longer have any resistance, so there's no loss. And then we want to be so cold that we're actually reducing the thermal noise. So uh, think of like when you're tuning your radio and you actually dial in to the exact radio station, but as you're moving through that dial, there's this noise. And so what you do is we just turn down that noise so that you hear the quantum signal come out. That's a great analogy. That's fabulous, because I don't know, I mean, I have a degree in computer science. I don't know if I ever understood that just until right now when you use okay. the analogy of tuning into a radio, because it just, you can suddenly see it and make perfect sense. We have all these companies that are trying to develop quantum computers. There's Google, there's IBM. Recently, Honeywell said they're gonna be making a foray into that. Why the big rush? Well, I think there's a lot of excitement in the community. There are a number of architectures out there, and that's what's been great about the field, is that there's a number of um, other companies, universities, that are thinking about, well, let's go look at what nature, Mother Nature provides. Maybe you want to use, uh, say, ions or atoms, or say the spin of the electron. Well, our choice was to actually use superconducting materials and make circuits out of those that then macroscopically behave quantum mechanically. Um, and so these are some just very interesting times. And, and so what are some practical uses of quantum computing? 
Uh, that's a really great question. With Sycamore, we actually have the first practical application, which is um, so-called certified random number generator. Um, I'd like to say that there's this, it solves the practical problem of um, how do you pick seats at a wedding? <laughs> right. So, there, there, you um, know what? Let me tell you right now. There are <laughs> never good seats at a wedding. Somebody is That's always right. going to be pissed off that they did not get to sit where they wanted to sit. Now you're telling me That's quantum right. computing is going to solve all that? <laughs> what I love about this is that you can, well, if you actually do a random selection, truly random, and you can certify that it's random, then you can tell your relatives and your friends and you can blame it on your computer. Right? Exactly. Blame perfect. <laughs> I think more specifically, you'd actually touched it at the top of the show uh, where you mentioned, you know, some of the really nice breakthroughs that we expect in science, which is one that as a scientist myself, I'm very excited about. Um, I believe that with quantum computers, we, we may actually be able to help um, combat climate change. Wow. Uh, I think that there's obvious things associated with energy, creating better batteries, better pharmaceuticals, uh, so drug research, uh, the ability to actually... Uh, solve these problems that would otherwise take us infathomable amount of years to do, or take a lot of money to make these advancements in, you know, say drug research, that we could do that in a simulation where that simulation actually shows us the answer on a quantum computer. But I still won't be able to like type faster, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's it. Well, doctor, thanks again for coming on the Kim Commando show. And I don't know about you, but if the next Google Pixel is a quantum phone, I think I'm going to be switching to that one. Hey, thanks for watching. Now, a few things. Don't forget to click the like button and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more digital know-how, check out all these other great links.